we will resume recording. Let me share my screen. Which always helps. Okay, good. All right, so uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, today we are going to be covering chapter seven. Again, we're moving right along. Uh, today's chapter is on decision making, and I thought that what we might do is just take a quick poll. to sort of set up today's lecture. And so this poll is going to ask whether you think you are rational or not. And again, all of these answers are anonymous, so it's not about um, who answers how. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, as you go throughout your day, you make lots of decisions. Uh, you know, throughout your life, you're making lots of decisions. Would you consider those decisions rational? Would you consider your approach to life as a rational approach? Um, or maybe you don't. Maybe you think yourself is not being rational. So we got a bunch of answers. It certainly looks like we are trending in a particular direction. Um, so I'll just give it another couple of seconds to see if we can get those last couple of answers in. I don't know, I wonder if some people like when they log in using their phone, whether they can actually do the poll or not. Um, Anyways, okay, so we will end the poll in there. And I will share the results, okay? And it's clear, and I think if, if everyone were to um, participate in this poll, I mean, clearly we are trending in a certain direction here. Uh, you all are confident uh, that the way you behave is in a rational manner. Um, and yeah, I think that that is true of most people. Most people think that they act in a rational manner. And so we're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into what it means to act rationally, um, how valid is that assumption, and that um, if we take a more careful look at it, um, whether it actually holds that we are acting rationally or not. So, let me just delete this. So that's what's on the agenda for today. We're gonna to talk about rational decision-making and we're gonna talk about non-rational decision-making. Non-rational uh, is a very specific term um, and it's different from irrational, right? And so if you could be rational, uh, but you could not be rational. Um, and if you're not rational, it could be that you're irrational, uh, which would be different than being non-rational. So we'll talk about that. We're also gonna talk about uh, other kinds of, uh, well, types of decisions that you would make, uh, such as legal and ethical decisions. And then we will end it I think come in full circle and talk about what it means to adopt evidence-based uh, management practices. So just to clarify terms here, what is a decision? Um, a decision is a choice made from among available alternatives. And as you go throughout your day, you are making constant decisions, right? You made the decision to wake up at a certain time today. You made the decision to wear a certain outfit today. Uh, you made the decision perhaps on, you know, what to eat today or what not to eat today. You made the decision to attend this lecture, right? 
So your behavior essentially is the consequence of all of these sequences, a sequence of decisions that you make throughout your uh, throughout your day and, and throughout your life. Some decisions are more important than others. Um, and so what this chapter talks about really is that you can divide decisions into two types, rational decisions um, and non-rational decisions. And judging from the poll, I think all of you believe that the decisions that you made were uh, uh, fall in the rational camp, right? They were uh, rational kinds of decisions. Um, and I think this is assumption that people automatically make about the decisions that they uh, 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 about the decisions that they make. Um, and this assumption is has been tested, um, and it has been challenged. Uh, I think challenge is a better word. Um, and so we'll see to what extent uh, that this is actually true. And so. Decision-making is just the process of identifying and choosing alternative courses of actions. And so the decision-making process, there's actually a lot that goes into it um, that you probably take for granted. And when you begin to break down that process and look at um, how much effort goes into each of those sort of parts, um, I think you might come to a different conclusion about uh, the, the, whether you're actually rational or not in the decisions that you made. And so there was this, um, who, uh, there was an economist, um, Daniel Kahneman. This is a name that you should know. Um, he is one of the key sort of academic thinkers uh, that looked at the decisions that people actually make. And he wrote a book uh, called Thinking Fast and Slow. It actually became, it, this book really summarizes uh, the results of the studies that he conducted on decision making. It became a bestseller. And one of the main takeaways from this is that uh, we make decisions in two different ways. Uh, system, what he calls system one and system two. Uh, system one is fast decision making. And this is largely intuitive, and we'll get into what intuition is, um, and largely unconscious. So not a lot of thinking goes into these fast decisions that you make that come out of what he terms system one. System two is a slower decision-making process, and this is more deliberate. You're more conscious of the steps and, uh, that you take in arriving at your decision, and it's more analytical. And, um, and so his work really challenged a lot of the assumptions people held about the way people actually make decisions. And so a lot of, uh, in economics in particular, perhaps you are familiar with a theory called rational choice theory. And rational choice theory makes the assumptions in trying to understand um, the behavior of um, people in making economic decisions, but really any decision um, in their lives, um, it made the assumption that people are rational. Um, and a lot of those, a lot of those assumptions, though, when you began studying uh, the actual decision making that people uh, engage in, begins to break down. And Daniel Kahneman is probably like the leading uh, academic uh, in this area. And economics as a discipline had this sort of major shift in their approach to understanding economic behavior. And that shift was from an assumption that people were rational, um, and we'll get into exactly what being rational is, uh, to an assumption that maybe people are not so rational uh, after all. And so behavioral e economics um, is sort of a field within economics uh, that actually looks at uh, the way people behave in practice and um, challenges some of the assumptions made in rational choice theory 
uh, that people act rationally. And we'll get into the details of, of what all of that means. So the rational model of decision making um, is really about um, how managers should make decisions. Um, and this was sort of assumptions that economists made about the way people actually make decisions. And so it assumes that managers make logical decisions that will be optimal and further in the organization's best interest, right? And so there's a logical process, a process of deduction based on, you know, assumptions that uh, the manager knows to be true. Um, and the manager arrives at uh, a solution uh, that he or she deems as the optimal choice, right? The best choice among all of the assumptions. And, and, and this is um, uh, among all of the choices. And this is basically the way in which we think about how people in their daily lives uh, make decisions. It is this rational process. And so the, the classical model of rational decision-making, which is an, the assumption that we had about the way people make decisions is, uh, so it, it's broken down into these stages. Uh, so first you'll identify the problem or opportunity, right? So what is it that you, you know, so what is the, the problem? Do, do you attend um, Jeff's lecture today or not, right? And then you think of the alternative solutions. Um, you can attend, right? That's one alternative. Uh, another is maybe you can do something else, right? Maybe there's something more valuable in your time. Maybe because we were holding lectures on Tuesdays each week, uh, there is something that's been occupying your time on Thursdays and you got into a routine um, and you find that more valuable and you get to skip the lecture, right? Um, there are lots of alternatives, right? There's lots of things that you could be doing. You could go out to dinner, you could be watching TV, you could be working on assignments. Uh, um, you know, and so, so, part, so step two of this rational process would be to think up all of the altern uh, alternatives to any decision that you're trying to make. And then stage three would be you would want to evaluate those alternatives and then select a, sol a solution. So what are the pros and cons of attending my lecture? What are the pros and cons of not attending, right? What are the pros and cons of, you know, uh, going out to dinner uh, during this time, uh, maybe taking a nap? Um, or, I don't know, uh, watching TV, watching videos on the internet. Um, so there's lots of alternatives, right? And so you'll weigh the, the pros and cons of all of those alternatives. Um, and, and then of course you arrive at stage four, uh, you arrive at a solution that you believe is optimal. And, and of course, in, in this following in this example, uh, very few things are more valuable than sitting through a lecture that I give. Um, so a lot of you made the correct decision um, and arrived from that the optimal choice among all your alternatives is to attend my Thursday lecture. And so this is basically uh, the model uh, that we assume uh, people go through when they arrive at a decision uh, when they are being rational. And so this is sort of referred to as the classical uh, model. But there's a problem with this model. There's a problem with this idea that people are looking at, you know, what it is that they are trying to achieve, um, assessing all of the, the alternatives, evaluating all of the uh, alternatives, and then arriving at what they um, analyze to be the most optimal, optimal decision uh, to take. There's problems with that. And this table lists some of these problems. And the problem is that the assumptions that you're making about uh, people being rational is not really realistic, right? And so some of the assumptions that were made, and these assumptions were explicit among economists within rational choice theory, when um, particularly before the, the switch to sort of uh, the behavioral uh, economic approach, some of the assumptions were that people were operating with complete information and no uncertainty, right? And so uh, in order to make any kind of decision, you need information, right? And that information uh, needs to be complete, 
right? You don't want to leave out gaps in your understanding. Um, you need to know whether, let's say, attendance in this class is mandatory or not, right? You need to know um, what the actual penalties are for not attending my lecture. Um, if you don't know this information, right, you are not making a rational choice, right? Because it's not based on information. Um, that information that you're basing your decisions on also has to be accurate, right? And, and often people don't know, you know, how many people know actually whether you are required to attend your classes? Is it required? Uh, what are the penalties for not attending your classes? I, I, I'm sure if I did a poll on that, uh, we would have variant answers, right? And so some of you are not going to be accurate. Um, the, the information that you have about the attendance policies uh, may not be accurate. Um, and what do you know about all of the alternatives? There could be an infinite amount of alternatives, right? How do you know that the only alternatives are just to maybe watch TV or you know, take a nap or you know, eat a meal, right? There's maybe a lot of other things that you could be doing. Um, and those are not things that you're going to consider in making your decision, right? So how do you know that your decision that you arrive at is the optimal one? Um, and so, um, and then also when you do analysis, um, how logical is the analysis, analysis uh, you have done? Um, often what we find is that when people are making evaluations, when they're making judgments, a lot of biases creep into their thinking. And he's a well-known, we're not going to get into the biases, biases today, that would be in the recorded lecture. Um, but this is going to alter the reasoning process that you, that you use, right? And, and, uh, and again, this is well-known uh, problems that people experience in their reasoning. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, um, it, it's really unclear as to whether uh, you're going to make the optimal choice or not. Um, and so, so given all of these challenges, um, given all of these challenges, it's not actually true that people engage in this rational approach um, to decision-making, right? Because it's just too difficult. And, you know, in this slide, it sort of lists the barriers uh, that exist in order to achieve this sort of perfectly rational decision-making uh, process. Um, and there's a lot of uh, barriers that I have listed here. Um, you know, life in the world is very complex. There are so many variables that impact, um, you know, what your options are. Uh, what the outcomes of each of those options are, right? Your ability to make sense of all of it. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time. You don't have an infinite amount of time uh, to consider all of these options, right? And so, um, you know, so people aren't really, when we study the way people actually arrive at decisions, it turns out that, that you know, these barriers are too great. And it takes a lot of effort, right? I mean, so when you think back as to uh, the decision you made about whether to attend this lecture, there was no sophisticated analysis. Um, it was probably just something automatic that you did, right? Um, there wasn't much evaluation, right? There, you weren't plotting choices. You weren't running statistical models, right? You weren't writing things down. What are all my options? You didn't make a list. Um, you know, you probably didn't make a list in your head of all the different options and, you know, there was no conscious effort to assign, you know, benefits and costs to each of those options. I don't think you've done any of that, right? And when you look at all of the decisions that you make throughout the day and throughout your life, you find that, that you know, this whole rational process, um, you didn't really engage in at all. Um, even I would bet a lot of you um, didn't even engage in much of a rational process for the big decisions in your life, 
like the decision to attend Baruch, um, rather, you know, to go to college rather than not to go to college, you know, how much rational analysis um, went into um, making that decision, the decision to, you know, become a business major, how much rational analysis went into this? These are very big decisions in your life, right? Very big decisions about what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Um, you know, the major that you select is going to have an enormous impact. And how much of this rational process did you really go through? Um, was there a sophisticated analysis? For some of you, maybe there was. Um, but for many of you, even though this is such an enormous decision uh, with such enormous consequences, you probably didn't put much rational effort into it. And so given all of the difficulties of the, pro the rational process, it turns out that, that we don't really make use of it that often. <laughs> uh, and that a lot of the decisions that you make, even decisions that you make um, for the, the very important decisions in your life, uh, the decisions that uh, have you know, enormous consequences, even for those, uh, you're not going to engage extensively in this rational process. So the, the answers that you gave in this initial poll about whether you are rational or not, all of you made the assumption that you are, and I think that's a safe assumption to make. It's, a, it's an assumption that people made for a very long time about the way people actually make decisions. It's, it's the way the economics discipline, uh, it's the assumption that the economics discipline made about kinds of decisions that you are making, um, uh, but it's, it's not accurate. Um, people aren't really rational. They're not really going through this process. And, and, and it's because of these reasons here. Um, you know, it's difficult to get access um, to all the information you need. Um, a lot of often that information that you get is not accurate. Uh, you don't really know what all of your alternatives are. It's difficult to assess the value of those alternatives. It's difficult to assess what the benefits and costs of each of those alternatives are going to be. It takes a lot of mental effort to engage in this process, which is exhausting, right? So people don't spend that, that mental effort. Um, and then when you work it as a manager, you're gonna find that, um, you know, there's going to be additional barriers, um, even when you deliberately engage in a rational process, um, which we'll get to at the end of this lecture, um, you're gonna find that even if you make a concerted attempt to engage in a rational decision-making process, that there's going to be these barriers that you're going to be up against that will prevent you from being rational. Um, and, and so this is part of the challenge of being a manager. Um, this is part of a challenge of living in this world, right? And being effective in this world and, and, and being successful in life. So rationality, uh, it turns out that we aren't all that rational after all. And I just realized that I don't have the chat up. Um, so yeah, and so one of the questions um, in the chat is this question about uh, John Nash and game theory. Yeah, and so uh, game theory is very complex. Um, and this is sort of a development that is outside of the rational choice uh, model of human decisions. Um, so game theory, um, makes assumptions uh, that I think are relatively accurate about how people make decisions, um, uh, but it is uh, um, different. And so it just, it just takes, game theory sort of takes a different approach to understanding the way uh, people make decisions. It's a theory, but it's an accurate theory. Uh, this is not uh, like the early versions of rational choice theory, which made faulty assumptions. Um, uh, this is often uh, game theory involves uh, people who are in competition with each other. Um, uh, so yes, 
Um, I think that that uh, game theory is um, uh, a useful model for understanding um, the way people behave. This is something that developed after rational choice theory and after we gained, I think, an understanding of some of the uh, lack of rational approaches that, that people take in, in, in making their decisions. So is there any questions about rationality? Is it surprising that maybe you're not as rational as you thought? Uh, do you dispute this? Are you the kind of person who actually did extensive rational analysis and arriving at the decision to come and attend this lecture? Okay, good. So, um, so if we're not rational, then what are we? Um, and you know what? What the the research suggests is that uh, when we're not being rational, we're being non-rational, which is um, different than uh, being irrational. So, being irrational. Uh, it's not something we're going to explore in this lecture. I think that is more about um, engaging in behaviors that sabotage um, your ability to arrive at your goals rather than just not putting in the effort uh, to maximize the choices, uh, uh, the effectiveness of the choices that you make. So non-rational is not about not, uh, it's not about sabotaging uh, your ability to realize your goals. Um, it's just an approach that doesn't do a lot of the things that rational decision-making requires. And so um, some of the assumptions that this sort of non-rational decision-making model uh, makes is that decision-making is nearly always uncertain and risky and that it's very difficult to arrive at optimal decisions, right? So we went through all of that. Being rational is not easy, so most people uh, don't engage in rational decision-making. They engage in non-rational decision-making, and there's two types that we are going to discuss, two types of non-rational decision-making uh, that people engage in. One is called satisficing, and the other is called intuition. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of intuition, maybe the term satisficing is new to you. Um, so uh, there is a researcher, another economist, uh, Daniel Kahneman, a famous uh, Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist. Uh, this is another Nobel Prize winning economist, Herbert Simon. Herbert Simon is a, is a name that you should know uh, because um, he is really the one who uh, brought up the idea that uh, challenged the assumptions of rational choice theory that uh, the, econ the economics profession was making about the way people make decisions. And this goes back to the 1950s. Um, and then and he basically says what, what, what we've been saying up until this point, uh, that the ability of decision makers to be rational is limited by numerous constraints. Um, and so there's this term called bounded rationality. Uh, people's ability to be rational is bounded um, by all of these different constraints. And so bounded rationality is a term that you should certainly know. Uh, and because of bounded rationality, people don't really engage in rational behavior. Um, uh, it, being rational is very difficult uh, for all of the reasons we listed. Uh, it's complex making decisions. Um, you know, it costs money uh, to, uh, to get all the information you need. Um, you don't really have the time to do that. Um, also, people have varying degrees of cognitive capabilities. Um, and all of us have a limit on our cognitive cap uh, capacities. So there's a limited ability for us, even if we were to get access to all of this information, there's a limited ability for us to make sense of it. 
right? Even if we did have access to all the information and this information was accurate, and we had all of these, uh, all of the alternatives laid out in front of us, um, can we make sense of all of that information? From that, will we be able to identify what the optimal decision is? Um, and perhaps not, uh, you know, because our brain capacity, our cognitive capacity, our ability to analyze inf information is limited. And so that limitation is part of this bounded rationality uh, that constrains us in our ability to be rational when we make decisions. So Herbert Simon says, given this bounded rationality, what people are actually doing, they're not selecting the most optimal decision. What they're, at, what they're doing instead is they are selecting the option that is good enough. And this is what he refers to as satisficing. Um, we're not going through an exhaustive list of all the alternatives. Um, we're engaging in a process. And once we come to a solution that we find satisfactory rather than optimal, that's the decision that we select. So attending this lecture was satisfactory to you, right? There wasn't enormous costs um, to attend in, um, and that's why you decided to attend. Um, uh, it wasn't like you went through an exhaustive list of your alternatives or what you can do with your time instead of attending my lecture, um, went through that list and, and decided on something. Uh, rather, you decided, yeah, this is satisfactory for me to attend, and that's what I'm going to go with. Um, so that is one way of being non-rational. The other way that we are non-rational is uh, through intuition. And so intuition here is defined as making a choice without the use of conscious thought or logical inference. And if you read the textbook, they say that intuition is derived from sort of these two processes. Uh, one is expertise which is drawn from the tacit knowledge that you gain. And tacit knowledge is knowledge that you have about something that you can't quite express, right? And so if someone were to ask you, well, how do you know? Um, it would be difficult to respond. It would be difficult to answer. You sort of know that you know about it, but you can't really put it into words. Uh, this is part of the tacit knowledge that you acquire. Um, and then automated experience. Based on this knowledge, you will have an emotional response um, to sort of the options that you are presented with, right? And so decisions are prompted by a feeling that you get, right? It sort of feels good. I feel good about making this decision, um, so I'm going to go with it, right? I walk into this alley. I'm not quite sure about it. It doesn't feel right. I think I'm going to turn around and leave. Um, there's not a lot of rational thought, there isn't logic to it. It's a feeling that you get and you make a decision based on that feeling. Um, so, so I pose the question, um, is intuition mystical? And I, and I think when people who sort of embrace this approach to decision-making, um, uh, people, you know, it's hard to explain what intuition is um, and so people think it's something that's mystical. Um, you know, where is this feeling I'm getting coming from? If it's not coming from my own conscious, rational thoughts, you know, maybe it's coming from someone else, right? Someone else or some other thing is feeding me this information, right? Maybe something spiritual, something on some other uh, plane of existence, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, people think that this is perhaps maybe a supernatural process or a mystical process, um, but there's evidence to, to suggest that it's not, right? That this is part of our capabilities. And so I think, um, so I, I wrote up this slide, I think hopefully it sort of better explains what intuition is. Um, and, and, and basically what happens is, you're going to develop knowledge based on past experiences 
and associations that you make based on those uh, experiences, right? So I don't know, maybe you saw a movie and lots of movies, uh, people you know, got attacked violently in dark alleys, right? Um, that's going to be stored in your brain. Your brain is going to take note of that. It's not going to be a conscious uh, process. Um, and it's going to associate dark alleys with you know, victims of violence, let's say. Um, and so I, just as you go through life, all of these things are going to be happening around you that your brain is going to take notice of. Uh, it's going to recognize different associations based on the experiences you have. Uh, and it's going to build up this base of knowledge that's sort of beyond your conscious awareness. Um, and then, you know, even when you're not thinking about things, your brain is constantly processing information, right? Your brain never turns off, even when you're sleeping. Your brain is constantly active, so it's constantly doing something. Um, and so it's operating at levels that you are not aware of, that you're not conscious of, right? Um, there's vast parts of your brain uh, that are active uh, and doing things that are beyond your uh, consciousness, that you're not conscious of. And so part of this process, and it's, it's looking at its past experiences and associations, and it's helping you better understand the world um, and better predict what might be happening, you know, in the future based on that understanding. And that in your brain, in these sort of unconscious processes are then reporting back to you the results of what it's figured out, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got a, a better understanding of what's happening and a prediction of what ha might happen to you in the future. And it reports those results, not through a conscious sort of uh, idea that you can verbalize, but through an emotion, right? So it reports back to you through feelings. And so I think that what this intuition, what intuition is, is you experience this feeling and this feeling is really just a product of these unconscious brain processes uh, that are going on beyond your awareness, the analysis that it's doing, and it's just another form of information uh, that you're being fed. Uh, so it's just a nonverbal sort of a form of information that people use to evaluate things. And so intuition um, is useful. Um, it could be uh, very accurate. Um, and so your um, uh, textbook gives some uh, tips on how, to, how you might improve your intuition. But basically, since, um, you know, since your intuition comes from your past experiences and associations that your brain is making from those experiences. If you want to improve your intuition, um, the way you do that is exposing yourself to as many new experiences as possible, because that's sort of the raw material that your brain's going to use in order to make its evaluations, right? And in order to make its sort of recommendations, right? And it's going to make those recommendations uh, through the emotions that you feel. So also pay attention to the emotions that you feel. You know, how do you feel about a particular decision? Does it feel good to you or does it not, right? And often when you get those feelings, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, where you made a decision and you feel really good about it, or you made a decision and you don't quite feel good about it. That emotion that you're feeling is your brain sending you a signal based on information that it's processed. Um, this is the idea of intuition. You are getting intuition. The question is, how accurate is that? Should you go off of your uh, feelings, right? How much value should you attach uh, to the feelings that you get when you make a decision? So one of the things that the, the textbook mentions is that um, you want to take note of how accurate your intuition is, right? So when you get these feelings, take note of it, um, take note of what it was telling you, and then figure out later whether it was accurate or not. Right? Or think back on past experiences of intuition that you had and see whether it was accurate or not. Um, and your intuition will become more accurate the more ideas that you're exposed to, uh, the more data that you're exposed to, the more experiences that you're exposed to. Um, and so that's, that's the basic idea of intuition. And so those are the two forms of non-rational decision-making uh, processes that you make use of. Um, so rationality is very difficult. It's exhausting. Um, and so most of the decisions we make are non-rational. 
uh, by satisficing, uh, which is I just do whatever is most satisfactory. Something pops up as a solution, I feel good about it, uh, so I do it. The feeling good about it is part of your intuition. That is another way in which we arrive at decisions. Um, and so those are two examples of non-rational decision-making that we uh, engage in. So a question in the chat is, is a gut feeling part of intuition? That's exactly what intuition is. I would say that that gut feeling that you have is an emotion, right? And that emotion came from someplace. Um, and uh, it came from perhaps this nonverbal um, uh, processing that your brain was doing, right? And your brain was trying to feed you some information in the form of this feeling. So that's exactly what intuition is. Some, some people might feel it in their gut. Um, the feelings might be different, uh, but certainly that is an example of it. Yeah, uh, so excellent point. Any other questions about intuition, improving your intuition? All right, so we'll move on. Um, so what kinds of decisions do you have to make? One of the things, you, you're gonna need to make lots of kinds of different kinds of decisions, uh, but an important one that uh, business schools want to now emphasize uh, among future managers is making ethical decisions. We touched a little bit upon this in chapter three, uh, when we, and it was actually, uh, when we talked about stakeholder theory and in the recorded part of the lecture, we talked more about ethics. Uh, but ethics, just to define the term, is the standards of right and wrong that influence behavior, right? So what is it that you think is right? You know, is it right to uh, pay minimum wage? Uh, to employees, um, and based on whether you think it's right or wrong, uh, that's going to influence your, your behavior. If you think it's okay to pay minimum wage, um, you know, there'll be nothing stopping you from paying that. If you think it's wrong, uh, ethically wrong, based on the value system you have to, to pay workers minimum wage, maybe because you, you recognize that uh, it's not quite, um, uh, uh, an appropriate standard of living uh, that you can get from that. It's not enough money to get the things you need. So, you know, you'll make attempts within your company to pay people more than minimum wage. So that's ethics. Ethics has become a big deal, not only because uh, sometimes, well, often workers get paid wages uh, that are not enough to live adequately, uh, but because um, businesses have been in the past and currently, I mean, it happens all the time, engaged in very unethical behavior. Uh, some of the big ones were uh, Bernie Madoff. I don't know if you're familiar with Bernie Madoff. Is anyone familiar with Bernie Madoff? No. No. Okay, we gotta know. Do we have any yeses? No. So Bernie, Ma there we go, okay. All right, Dominique, yes, you nailed it, Ponzi scheme. So Bernie Madoff, um, it's just really just a perplexing example of unethical behavior because Bernie Madoff was the head of the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, it's about as, most, uh, about as prestigious a position as you can hold you know, within the world of Wall Street. New York Stock Exchange is, you know, the exchange where all the public companies are listed and traded. Um, so very well respected, very wealthy. Uh, he started an investment firm, very successful. And, and you're gonna be, you know, when you were the head of the New York Stock Exchange, people are going to trust your ability to invest. And so, um, you know, he had an investment company that became very successful, um, made tons of money. And then at some point, his company turned into a Ponzi scheme. And a Ponzi scheme is, um, I make an offer to you that says, you know, hey, look, if you invest your money with me, I guarantee you, you know, these exorbitant returns. I'll guarantee you 20% return on your money yearly. Now you're not gonna get 20% anywhere, right? So when you hear that, uh, you're gonna be very interested. 
right? Um, that's the kind of place where you want to invest your money. Um, and so he would make these claims um, and he would get tons of customers to invest their money with them, uh, but he wasn't able to deliver those kinds of returns consistently, nobody is. So in order to prove that he was generating these returns, because at some point you got to pay your customers, right? The returns that you generate. So what he would do is he would get a new customer, right? And the money that they gave him to invest, he would take that money and pretend that that's money that he earned through investing and use that to pay the people that came in before him to prove that, yeah, I was able to generate my 20% return. And so then you have the very happy customer said, yeah, he is able to, uh, to generate this 20% return because I'm getting my paychecks you know, every month, right? I'm able to get that, that money. And, he, and, and so he wasn't able to, to pay all of his customers uh, because he was generating returns. He was paying his customers by taking the money from the customers that came later. And so at some point, you eventually run out of new customers to fund the fake returns that you claimed you generated from your earlier customers. And because you know, he was such an important person and such a, um, you know, had this very prestigious position, was well respected, no one really questioned what he was doing. So he created a Ponzi scheme in the billions of dollars. It was the largest scam in the history of this country. Um, and uh, eventually it collapsed, right? And so people lost billions of dollars. And it was just shocking because this guy didn't need to do this to be successful, right? He was already hugely successful. But at some point, he made a decision. Um, and I think as he explains it, you know, he needed to make sort of ends meet. He made this minor decision. Let me just do this just, just this one time. Uh, just to fix this problem, I can easily rectify it, you know, next week when, you know, we get money from here and, I, you know, this is very temporary. And you sort of rationalize um, this process of engaging in eth unethical behavior where you're like, it's just a minor ethical slip. Um, you know, he never set out from the beginning to say, you know what, my goal here is to create the largest Ponzi scheme in history. But you take that one small step, which you think is no big deal. Um, then it requires you to maybe take the second one. You're like, okay, I'll just take the second one. It'll be no big deal. And before you know it, you're in too deep. And you're like, now I have to continue down this path because otherwise they're going to find out all of these unethical steps. So it's sort of this slippery slope and uh, it's, it's often easy to rationalize taking those very early steps. And that leads you to the more drastic unethical steps that you have to take later. And so you see these examples of these massive companies that, that engage in these massive frauds. Um, so um, companies are being very proactive now about trying to prevent that process from happening. And so uh, companies will have ethics officers and an ethics officer's sole responsibility is to make sure that first step is never taken. And often it's not clear what the ethical decision is. Um, and so you know, you would have to go to an ethics officer to find out, you know, whether this decision is ethical or not. Um, you know, maybe your, your, your company, um, you know, wants to move operations to a country where they have different kinds of regulations. Maybe they're not as strict um, uh, with, the, with the process. Um, so you're allowed to maybe get rid of this pollution that your process generates. Um, in a way that's a lot less expensive uh, because they don't care as much maybe about the environment. And this is all legal to do, right? But the question is, is it ethical? Is it the right thing to do? And often the answers to that are not very clear. And so companies adopt ethics officers in order to help guide decision-making and, and, and to ensure that the decisions that people make are ethical. Your... Uh, um, Textbook gives an example. So how do you make, how do you arrive at a decision that's ethical? They suggest making a, a graph of decisions um, and their possible consequences. And they give you um, an example of that here. So this is an example of an ethical decision tree. I mean, basically here in this example, and you can, there's different forms of this that you can employ, but it's really just to map out 
what all your options are in, in making your decision. Um, and of course, this would be a very rational process, right? Um, uh, you know, mapping out what your options are, what all your choices are, what the alternatives are, and the pros and cons of each is a rational process. And they, you know, they recommend that you do that in order to determine whether the decision is ethical or not. Um, and so, does anyone have any questions about ethics, making ethical decisions? Look, I, I bring up the Ponzi scheme, the, the Bernie Madoff example, uh, in part because, well, I mean, it was, it was enormous, right? So it was big news, it was a number of years ago when it happened, um, but I am a suffering Mets fan, um, and I don't know how many Mets fans we have here, uh, but the Wilpons are, are the people, the family that owns the New York Mets, and they invested a lot of money with Bernie Madoff, like, like everyone else. Um, and apparently they lost a ton of money. Um, and uh, uh, because they lost a ton of money, it was difficult for them to properly run the New York Mets. So we never were able to like go out and buy like the top talent. We would lose a lot of players to free agency because they couldn't afford to pay them, right? And it was just, just a disaster as a Mets fan. Um, and here we are in New York, the biggest city in the country, right? And we got this minuscule payroll uh, because our owners lost all their money in some Ponzi scheme. So it's made me a little bitter. I'm not gonna lie, it's made me a little bit. I mean, I'm happy to report, I don't know how much, how many of you follow this, but the Wilpons are no longer the owner of the Mets. We just found out recently, a couple of weeks ago, that they sold the team to someone else, someone who hasn't lost billions of dollars to Bernie Madoff. Uh, so I'm very excited about the future of the New York Mets. Anyways, so. I'll get off my rant. Um, in going through these decisions, I was actually also going to talk about uh, the process that the New York football giants take. I don't know how many of you are football fans, but um, uh, but this is sort of a big thing within sports. The approach that sports franchises take, and in particular general managers, in running their organization, and the extent to which they are rational and use rational processes. Um, and so I was going to sort of use that as an example, but I didn't want to, you know, go off. I because look, it would prompt me to go on rants about how poorly managed the Giants are right now. Um, so Dave Gettleman uh, is the GM of the New York Football Giants. Um, and then a, a question that I would have that I always think about um, as I suffer through uh, the games that I watch every Sunday and just see, see them get blown out, you know, week in and week out is to what degree Dave Gettleman is, has adopted an evidence-based approach to decision-making. Um, and so in this last section, this last section is evidence-based management. And evidence-based management is the translation of principles as it's defined here, the translation of principles based on best evidence into organizational practice. So you wanna find out what works, what your options are, what the most effective ones are, um, and adopt that approach to your decision making. So it's it's a deliberate effort to bring rationality to your decision making process. So now intuition's good, right? These non-rational forms of decision making are effective. Um, you know, you 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 should not deny them. Um, but the decisions ultimately that you make should be informed based on evidence to the degree. Uh, that you can uh, make use of evidence. Uh, so you want to adopt an evidence-based practice um, to your decision-making as a manager. And, um, you know, some of the principles that the textbook sort of suggests in implementing an evidence-based practice are listed here. Uh, treat your organization as an unfinished prototype. I think that's important. I actually did, I don't know if any of, any of you are familiar with the concept of the lean startup. It's an approach to, um, it's an entrepreneurial approach to starting a new business. Uh, and it's referred to as the lean startup approach. It's very popular. I don't know how many of you have uh, designs about becoming an entrepreneur in the future and starting your own company. If you do, you'll probably come across this idea of the lean startup 
because it's, it's one way of um, uh, starting a company. And um, it's in contrast to the typical way that people are taught in um, starting a business. And um, I, I, I've written a paper on this, uh, so I've done studies in this area. Um, and this, this first principle gets at that, uh, which is to treat your organization as an unfinished prototype. The lean startup is this idea that when you start a company, um, a lot of entrepreneurs have it all figured out in their head. They create a business plan where they write down exactly what they're trying to accomplish, um, what their business is going to look like, what the products and services are going to look like, the target market that they're going to um, hope to sell those goods and services to. Um, and everything is sort of uh, designed uh, first before the company is even launched. And the Lean Startup challenges that idea and they're saying that, look, as an entrepreneur, you have limited access to information and all these decisions you're making about what your product and service should look like is not based on evidence. You know, what studies have you conducted to prove the assumptions that you're making are true? Um, and so uh, this is an effective approach that you can adopt even as a manager. And it's the idea that you go into any kind of task not really knowing what the best option is, right? And so then what you want to do is you want to, instead of committing to a one particular idea, uh, you want to try an idea and then gather evidence to assess whether it's effective or not. And so the lean startup approach to start a business is all you develop is a prototype, which is just a minimum sort of working uh, version of the product idea that you have, introduce it to the market and see what the reaction is. Um, get feedback from your customers. Is this something that they're actually interested in? Uh, what do they like about it? What do they not like about it, right? And then you iterate on that initial prototype uh, and you keep on changing it based on the evidence that you receive uh, by engaging with your actual customer base. And so this is sort of foundational to an evidence-based process. And it turns out um, that this is very effective and it leads to an increase uh, uh, improved performance. So an increased chance that your business is going to be successful. Um, uh, yeah, so they're able to uh, turn a profit quicker. Uh, they're more likely to turn a profit. They're more likely uh, to be around after five years. Uh, so it's definitely effective and it's effective because it adopts an irrational, irrational approach to decision-making. Uh, it's not that, you know, the entrepreneur is sort of all knowing, they know better than everyone else exactly what the customer needs, right? And they develop the ultimate product or service. Um, and then all you need to do is introduce it to the market uh, and people will just buy it because you've already predetermined that it's something that they want. Um, those assumptions that you make, you know, um, uh, may not be true. They all need to be tested. So. So that's, that's one principle that um, they recommend you adopt. I recommend that also. And th these, are, these are principles that you can actually adopt um, even as a manager. So any kind of initiative, project, new product, anything that you introduce, um, you always want to be sort of testing the assumptions and never go into it with the idea that this is definitely going to be the final version of this product treat everything as a prototype. This is a work in progress. We're going to introduce it to the world. We're going to collect data to see whether it's actually effective or not. Uh, but that process is not easy, right? So, and we already went through the difficulties in being rational. And of course, an evidence-based practice is bringing rationality to your decision-making. Um, and here's some of the reasons that they give. Um, there's too much evidence, right? You can, you can be inundated with, uh, inundated with data, um, then you don't know the quality of that data, right? Is that evidence that you're receiving actually accurate? Uh, does it apply? Um, often people are trying to mislead you. Um, you know, even if you're a manager, right, and you're trying to get an understanding of how some initiative impacts the people uh, who are subordinate to you, um, you know, they may want to mislead you about what's actually happening. Uh, there may be incentives for them uh, to give you answers uh, that are not actually true. Um, you know, if you're trying to purchase a product, right, the people who are selling you the product 
you're relying on relying on them for information about the product that they're selling you, but you know they're incentivized to sell you, not to to make you most informed, right? And so they may mislead you. Um, uh, and then uh, also this idea that stories are more persuasive, anyways. Um, so do we really have to operate based on a sophisticated analysis of the evidence? Um, you know, people don't really care about that. They get lost in the numbers. Like, this is, it's too much for them to process. What they, what people really respond to is stories, right? So if I can come up with a good story about what we're doing, you know, that would be the most effective approach. Um, so these are things that you want to avoid. Um, business analytics is a form, it's an approach to evidence-based um, uh, business practice. And Really, analytics is just uh, it's just data analysis. It's a sophisticated form of data analysis. There's lots of different kinds. Uh, so basically, you want to gather data about what you're doing, and then you want to analyze that data in a sophisticated way. Uh, usually, that means uh, running statistical models, uh, running regressions uh, to see uh, what is actually correlated with what, um, you know, so, you know, they give you, well, let's see, this picture, um, is, of, I guess, some kind of farm, um, and there's a drone, I guess, flying around. So, I mean, perhaps what's going here, going on here is that you might have a, a drone, you know, fly across your, your, your farm that takes pictures. This picture may be able to uh, detect diseases or maybe whether some plants are lacking water and you might be able to determine some areas maybe uh, are not getting enough water or there is a, a disease emerging in some part of your crops, you know, whatever. I mean, so the, the basic idea is that um, you want to be able to gather lots of information um, and sometimes the, the, the information that you gather is uh, you need the help of uh, computer models uh, to make sense of it. Um, big data is another form of analytics. This is a buzzword that I am almost sure you have encountered. Um, and big data means just that you're going to collect a massive amount of data in anything that you can imagine because it's not clear to us what are the things that trigger the results that you want, right? And so um, maybe getting back to my um, example of the New York Giants. So Dave Gettleman, uh, you know, he's, he's in charge of deciding who we should select, uh, who we should draft, who we should trade for to make up our team. And one of the most important decisions he made was selecting a quarterback to replace Eli Mann, who was a very successful quarterback for the Giants for many years, but he was at the end of his career. So now we needed to replace him with a new franchise quarterback. And he selected Daniel Jones, um, which ran counter to um, the advice of almost everyone. And when, when he uh, was interviewed about, you know, why he selected Daniel Jones, he says he saw him in some game some pro bowl, uh, some bowl game in college. And he says he fell in love. And so what that tells me, and this is the word that he used, he fell in love, <laughs> he fell in love with Daniel Jones as he watched him play this one game. And to me that, that says that maybe he wasn't relying on a lot of evidence. The fact that he fell in love suggests that he was operating off of a, an emotional response that he experienced from watching him. And so, he was relying on intuition. Now, Dave Gettleman is a very experienced general manager. Uh, so there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of associations that he has built up over time. So the intuition of a Dave Gettleman needs to be taken seriously. And so if he's falling in love with a quarterback, uh, I think that this is a relevant piece of information that you need to consider. However, um, you don't want to rely entirely on intuition alone especially when you are making these most important decisions. Um, what you want to do is supplement that with uh, a more evidence-based approach, an approach that brings a rational process to your decision-making. Um, big data is an approach that every modern company is making use of. 
Um, it's effective. It improves decision making. Um, uh, sports franchises, almost all of them now are adopting a big data approach. Um, so reporters asked Dave Gettleman whether uh, he has taken this modern approach uh, to decision making by making use of big data like a lot of these other franchises are doing. Um, and his response is like, yeah, we got a couple of computer guys. And, and, and when you respond to this, you know, sophisticated approach of, um, you know, modeling all of this different data and, and using statistics to, to make sense of it uh, as, you know, a couple of computer guys, to me, I suggest he's discounting the value of the big data approach. And, and just like I'm a, I, I've been a Suffering Mets fan, I'm now a Suffering Giants fan, I think in part because Dave Gettleman is relying too much on a non-rational approach to the decisions he makes in running that team by making these enormous decisions based on uh, the feelings of love that he gets from players um, and his dismissal of uh, in a, a big data approach, a rational, sophisticated big data approach to decision making, you know, by dismissing it and, and saying, yeah, we have a couple of computer guys. Um, and, you know, so we haven't won a game at all this year. Who knows? We may not win any games this year. Um, uh, that's okay. Um, I won't bring my, the miserable feeling that I experience on Sunday <laughs> to my lectures, you know, on Tuesday, because I still feel it on Tuesday. I'm not gonna lie. I still feel a little bit, you know, down on Tuesday after, you know, you get blown out by 30 points by the 49ers who are like basically a, a backup team. Um, I won't let it interfere though with the enthusiasm um, for each of these lectures. However, the, I think that the takeaway here, the important takeaway um, is that you need to embrace this. A lot of franchises have, there was actually a movie called Moneyball. How many of you, have any of you, heard of the movie Moneyball, or familiar with the concept of Moneyball? We have a no. So any yeses? Will we get a yes in the chat? I don't think we will. Um, so Moneyball was a movie that came out, I mean, it may be before your time, it's certainly probably before most of your time, um, it came out a few years ago, I don't know, maybe 10 years, I don't really know when it came out. Uh, but it was a number of years ago, and it was a movie about how the Oakland A's in baseball, um, who's in a small market, they don't have a lot of money to play with, they had one of the smallest, um, uh, um, the, the amount of money that they spent on their plays was like the least amount in the league, right? Um, but yet they were consistently able to do well. Uh, and compete every year, and they wound up winning a World Series, you know, against the Yankees, who were able to spend like 10 times the amount of money, you know, that the Oakland A's was able to spend. And the question is why? How were they able to do that? How are they able to compete even though they don't have, uh, you know, anywhere near the kind of money these big city franchises have? And, and the answer is big data, uh, which is they looked at an enormous amount, most uh, people who run baseball teams, the traditional way is you look at a couple of stats. What is a, what is a person's average? You know, maybe what, how many home runs do they hit? How many RBIs? What is a pitcher's ERA? A couple of these basic stats. Um, and that's it. They'll make decisions based on those few stats. Big data is this approach that you may want to take into account a million variables, you know, 10 million variables. Um, variables, and you don't want to discriminate based on the variables that you use. You may not think it means anything, um, you know, to look at maybe whether the baseball player's parents are divorced or not, but you want to model that because it may have an effect, you know, on their ability to deliver in a clutch, let's say at the end of the game, uh, you know, when uh, uh, the results of the game are on the line. Um, you just don't know. And so the Oakland A's took a big data approach to managing their organization um, made use of uh, big data and, and, and made decisions based on that. So it's an evidence-based rational approach that works, that's very, very effective. Almost every baseball team now uh, uses this big data approach. Uh, and so this, this idea um, um, was uh, captured in this movie Moneyball. Um, and it was, it was 
first there was a book about it uh, that describes you know their use of, of big data and, and data analytics um, so that uh, basically wraps up our lecture on decision making um, some uses of big data I mean obviously <laughs> if you want to run a successful franchise uh, sports franchise you probably want to make use of big data but big data uh, many of you will probably not go on to run uh, sports franchises however big data still matters um, it, it's used in almost every industry in almost every organization it's a practice you should adopt it's it's a, a method that you should adopt um, it is very effective uh, but one way it's used used that it's definitely having a big impact on you is uh, all of these tech companies are collected massive amounts of information on all of the things that you do with their devices and software. So the emails that you send, the text messages, the phone conversations, the locations that you go to, the ratings that you give, the comments that you make, the videos that you watch, the stories that you read, the, uh, the, the, the things that you may pause a video on, uh, how, how long do you hover on that little clip on YouTube to see you know, the little animation, um, uh, how long you watch videos, all of this massive amount of data uh, that's capturing the behaviors that you're engaged in um, is being stored and analyzed by big data. And this is an issue of privacy, um, but these tech companies, you know, like Google, like Microsoft, um, know so much about you um, that, you know, it's now become an issue of privacy. They probably know you better than you know yourself. Um, and they make use of this data in order to predict the things that you're going to do in the future, in particular, um, what kinds of products that you're going to buy. Uh, there's this sort of famous story about Google being able to predict that someone was pregnant before even the girl knew that she was pregnant and they sent her um, some sort of promotional pack that had to do with pregnancy. Um, and part of the story uh, that made it uh, interesting was that uh, she was underage uh, and her dad got the, uh, the, this promotional piece um, that was sent to her and, and he was like, why are you getting this? And she's like, I don't know. And they later found out that uh, she was indeed pregnant and this was something I think Google uh, was able to figure out. So um, Google is watching. They know what you're up to. Um, and you know the, the things that Google feeds you um, when you do a search and it fills out the rest of that sentence for you, is based on an understanding of who you are, where you live, the beliefs that you have, and it knows all of that. Um, and so uh, with enough data, so this big data approach, with enough data, they can accurately predict, you know, the kind of person you are, the things that you're going to do, and in particular, the things that you're going to purchase in the future. So it's something to pay attention to. Um, it's proof, though, that at the end of the day, this is an effective way of understanding uh, people, and it's definitely a very effective way of uh, reaching the optimal decision rather than just satisfying. So <clears throat> that wraps up our lecture on decision making. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, I will stick around. Um, uh, but otherwise, yeah, we'll wrap it up here and have a, Oh, before you leave, actually, yes, let me cover the midterm. So the midterm will be on Tuesday. Um, it will be made available on Connect at uh, 410 on Tuesday. Uh, so you'll be able to begin the actual test uh, at that time. Um, and you will be given an hour and 15 minutes to complete the exam. Um, and yes, so make sure that you log in on time, make sure you log in to connect uh, so that there aren't any issues. Um, the content that we will cover, uh, yes, so it's only an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, you shouldn't use all of that time um, uh, to complete it. Uh, you, should, you shouldn't need to use, to use all that time to complete it. Uh, I'm not designing the test so that it would take an hour and 15 minutes to complete. Um, I don't know how many questions are going to be on it. On the syllabus, it said 50 questions, but maybe less. It's not going to be more than 50 questions. Um, it's only going to cover the content that I covered in my lectures, both in my live lectures 
and in my recorded lectures. So in those lectures, um, I've covered some things that weren't in your textbook, and there are some things in your textbook, and so you may be tested on that. Uh, so you may be tested on content that's actually not in your textbook. Um, um, and there's content in your textbook that I don't cover in the lecture. So that is not something you'll be tested on. So uh, you wanna look at the slides, uh, you want to look at whatever notes you've taken on the things that I mentioned during the lectures. That is what you will be tested on. Um, so uh, right now, I believe that all of the questions will be multiple choice. Uh, I don't guarantee that they will all be multiple choice. I haven't finished uh, making the exam yet. Um, it, there may be 50 questions, um, but there may be less than that. We will see. <laughs> Um, I haven't made the, the final, uh, the exam yet. So any other questions about the midterm, about decision-making? Um, oh, also one last thing real quick. Uh, so the university has adopted the policy that we will not monitor your computers while you take the exam. Um, so technically they will not be proctored by anyone. Uh, however, this doesn't give you license to cheat. Uh, this is not a quiz, it's an exam. Uh, so, uh, you know, we will trust uh, that you will be treating this just like any other exam with a proctor where you're not cheating. Um, it will not be open book, it will be closed book. There will be no Googling for answers. There'll be no referencing of notes um, while you take the exam. So it will be a traditional exam um, and you'll get a little bit more information at the beginning of your exam about it. I'm not quite sure what the logistics are going to look like, uh, but I will probably have you sign some kind of honor code um, attesting to the fact that uh, you uh, did not cheat during this process. So I think it's important, you know, not to cheat, uh, even though you may suspect that there might be an opportunity to. Uh, we're not going to monitor your computer. We will just trust, you know, that you will sort of do the right thing, do the, do the ethical thing um, when you take your exam. Uh, but I think that's it. Uh, of course, if, if you have any questions, I'm going to hang around for a few more minutes. Uh, you can always email me. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And have a great weekend. Thank you.